Janusz, let me know. I think we're good to start. Demo. Okay, welcome to the N3C Community Forum. And just as a quick welcome, presentation will be recorded and will be archived in the Data to Health YouTube channel, as we've been doing. Uh, and then as please use the Q&A button to post your questions. And there's also use the raise the hand feature for the host to unmute your microphone. Next. Okay, so key figures. Um, this is always a slide that's not static. It is always being updated. And we have up to 84 sites now, um, 22 and a half million people, 8.8 .8 million COVID positive cases, 32.7 billion rows, number of, <laughs> and billion, I could go through the other ones, but there are billions of other uh, data that we've uh, captured in this enclave for research purposes. Okay, so um, next set of presentations. Uh, we're in the final one for April, uh, but we'll have one uh, on May 13th. Initial look at COVID-19 among disability populations. Which be an excellent talk. That... And then on June 10th, 2024, um, algorithmic best practices, which will have some of our um, N3C people involved with it, some of our experts. Okay, so let's... Okay, so today uh, we have Lynn Parabesi from SEER or NCI, and um, I, I think this is going to be a great talk because SEER is such a great resource. Um, I'm working with SEER data and cancer registry data and other parts of my work, so I know the importance of it and the rich depth of the, of the data. So I'm really excited to for this presentation today. Thank you. Great. Do you want me to go ahead and start sharing? Yes. Okay. You, Dr. Murphy. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about SEER. I'm always excited to talk about this program. Um, SEER stands for the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program. I did not name that. I'm not sure where that came from. However, um, really what I'm going to focus on today is SEER is a population-based resource for cancer research. And hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you'll know more than you ever wanted to know about this SEER program. Um, first, I'd like to give you a little bit of general background. Um, we've been around and funded by NCI to support research on the diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes of cancer since 1973, so almost 51 years now. Um, the data are actually collected under public health reporting, state regulations, and um, therefore the reporting of the state registries is HIPAA exempt. So that's an important component that we often try to focus on. Um, and all the state regulations actually require reporting by all cancer care providers. So that means hospitals, physicians, pharmacists, for example, uh, laboratories, path labs, et cetera. We currently have uh, 18 population-based central registries in the SEER program, identified here with the dark blue on the right of uh, the U.S. map. And that covers about 48%, almost half of the U.S. population. In addition, we have what we call 10 research support registries. And these are uh, eligible, and they're shown in the light blue here, and these are eligible for special task orders under the SEER contract. Right now, four of those participate in the National Childhood Cancer Registry and in the Virtual Pool Registry, which I'll mention a little bit in a few moments. We receive about 850,000 incident cases every year. And uh, what's very exciting, uh, sort of related to N3C, is that we use a common data platform that's held in a central um, information management services, our contractor enclave, and that's important because it permits centralized and efficient linkages through their through IMS as the honest broker. We actually expanded uh, a few years ago, and the reason that we did that was basically to increase the representation of minorities. And you can see here in the dark blue versus the gray, which is the previous SEER program. And um, what's important about this is that it really 
allows us to increase the representation of these important population subgroups. And it also increases the sample size that enables research that target these population subgroups. For example, cohort studies such as RESPOND or MEC, and then it offers the potential to assess genomic patterns or treatment patterns and outcomes by subpopulation, which is very important. I wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the metrics because one of the things that we try to do, and I'm sure N3C does as well, is to demonstrate ROI. Um, we have over 21,000 publications that have used the SEER data for primary analysis, and probably well more than half of those have been in the last 12 years or so, 15 years. Um, we also support research grants. Um, in 2022, it was about 81.4 million. And we have a lot of data requests for which we provide a number of our data products, such as the research data or the research plus data set. We have a lot of collaborations. Um, we provide ACS, their models, for their cancer facts and figures, which gives the predicted number of cases each year. And as I mentioned, we have multiple data products within the SEER program, and I'll share some of these with you in a few moments. Um, I won't spend any time really on this slide, but I think it's important because it illustrates the broad um, diversity of products that have come out of the SEER program in their contractors related to SEER to support analysis, to support organization of the data, visualization of the data, et cetera. So next I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about methods that we are uh, developing in the last 10 to 15 years to help us more efficiently enhance the clinical relevance of the SEER program. Um, as you all know, cancer patients are diagnosed and managed um, by the oncology practices, uh, both, both in the community as well as NCI designated centers and academic centers. However, the practice of cancer of oncology is changing so rapidly that it's difficult even for specialized physicians to keep up to date. And in fact, there aren't any data outside of clinical trials that provide information on the dissemination and general use of new treatments and diagnostic methods, as well as to assess the impact of new treatments on outcomes in the general cancer population and of course by population subgroups. Guidelines for cancer treatment are based on clinical trials. However, these trials capture less than 5% of the cancer population and of course are non-representative, largely white and younger and having fewer comorbid conditions. And so we need a rapid, efficient collection of population level data that can help us understand the use and effects of these new treatments in patients outside that clinical trial setting. So really what we're trying to do here with SEER, um, this is our ultimate goal to provide a trajectory over time for each patient and their disease course from the time of diagnosis until death. And so each of the rows here represents a patient and the columns represent different data sources and I like to use this last row as an example. So this is a 23-year-old who had a stage three melanoma that was diagnosed in um, 2015 with, with a biopsy and then had a subsequent wide, wide excision. The patient was BRAF positive and unfortunately had uh, was treated with ipilimumab beginning in 12, 16, 1215, excuse me, a couple of months later, but then had um, a recurrence with gro groin mets and had a nodal dissection in that same year. The patient was then started on two oral antineoplastics, and the good news is, is that patient is still alive as of um, last uh, 8 2022. Um, and so I think it's really important here to illustrate that, um, to be able to follow these patients, because this patient with stage 3 melanoma um, prior to the oral antineoplastics may well not have been alive um, at this point if we didn't have these treatments. So as I mentioned, we're trying to capture more comprehensive data. Um, all of our SEER registries are on that central common data platform. And so we can do central linkages with automated integration into the SEER registries. And we have linkages with United Healthcare, uh, with a subset of Medicaid patients, with unlimited systems, which I'll talk more about in a moment, genomic lab data from Oncotype, Decipher, Castle, et cetera. And then also pharmacy data from CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, and United Healthcare Pharmacy Benefit Management System. We now have genetic data on a subset of our registries um, from Myriad, Ambry, and Vitae, and GeneLink. And we're working very hard to develop and implement automation for SEER processes through the, D the Department of Energy collaboration that we've had for a number of years now. Um, and we have three major fo foci there. One is ePath extraction, um, which collects structured data from our unstructured path reports. The reportability API, which I'm not really gonna talk about much, but it allows for rapid screening for reportable cancers. And then the last is the recurrence API, which helps us identify recurrent metastatic disease. Just to talk a little bit about how we're using some of these data. 
So claims linkages, um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with working with Medicare and Medicaid, et cetera, is that insurance claims really allow us to capture detailed longitudinal treatment information, comorbid conditions, tests that are performed, hospitalizations, and of course, recurrent uh, disease. We have, uh, as I mentioned, Unlimited Systems, which is a large claims processor for community oncology practice claims. And we have data from 2013 to 2021, and it represents about 17% of all of our cases to date. I mentioned we, link in, we linked with United Healthcare claims from 2000 to 2020, and we're getting ready to do a second linkage in a number of uh, about three more months, I think. And that had over 1.6 million patients and covers between 6 and 25% of the patients in each registry. And there's a lot of variation in the penetration of UHC from registry to registry. And we are in discussions with some other large commercial uh, insurers, as well as with Medicare. Uh, as I mentioned, we have pharmacy data. And this is really quite exciting because it provides us with data on oral antineoplastic agents from 2013 forward. And we've linked with CVS, Walgreens, and Rite Aid, and the United Healthcare PBM. And we've also brought in some pharmacy data from a data aggregator named Health Verity that helps us assess the gaps in pharmacy coverage and see for these other um, entities that I mentioned. We don't have population level data for pharmacy yet, um, but we're approaching that population level. However, um, the data that we do have really represents the largest data set on oral agents that are linked to a very diverse group of real world patients and linked to both clinical data and outcomes for those patients with cancer. So I'd like to use this slide as an example of some of the pharmacy data that we have in the SEER program. And so the table on the left is um, the uh, looking at SEER, I'm sorry, at 43 uh, TKIs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And um, really we had 43 agents with almost a half a million fills. I'm sorry, 47,000 47, patients, um, which is quite a large uh, set of data that allows us to be able to explore who gets it, who doesn't get it, et cetera. Um, the table on the right is also um, very important because it's a CDK4-6 inhibitors and its use. And this is a bit different because it looks at the use by cancer site. And as you might guess, um, breast is, of course, the, the most prevalent, but it is being used for, for probably off-label use for some of these other cancer sites. And for this, we have about 13,000 patients with 140,000 fills. Oops, sorry. And then the last table, which is in the middle of the graphic, actually shows temporal trends in PARP inhibitor use in about 75,000 patients from 2017 to 2022. And as you can see, um, there's a lot of variation in um, each of those um, PARP inhibitors over time. And so that's something that we're able to track with some of our oral antineoplastic data. I mentioned that we've linked with some of the germline testing companies, and we've done this at the population level for two registries, California and Georgia, uh, as a demonstration project that was actually built on um, a study by uh, uh, Stephen Katz and Allison Curry, who had a P1. And so initially, they linked all breast and ovarian cases in California and Georgia, which was phase one, and then they linked all cancers tested in phase two. And the objectives for the SEER program are really to be able to provide data for population benchmarking and quality of care for these patients, to demonstrate the feasibility of linking multiple genetic testing company panels with SEER data. And right now we're focusing on 50 some genes that are common to more than one company's panel so that those um, companies are not re-identifiable in the SEER data. We're, we have generated a de-identified data set that can be released to researchers via a, our tiered authentication and authorization process for SEER data. Um, it is available now for a soft launch um, and special request. And we're working to scale this linkage with the four genetic testing companies to the entire SEER program. And that's in process. And we're hoping to have this uh, linked by fall of 2024 of this year. This is just some examples of how this um, linkage can be used for benchmarking. Uh, to look at guideline uh, compliance, for example, for BRCA testing in ovarian and breast cancer patients. And I think what's important here is to note that that overall testing um, is 24% of breast cancers and only 31% for ovarian cancer patients, even though the guidelines suggest that virtually 100% of ovarian cancer patients should be tested for BRCA. And what was even a bit more disconcerting was that there's substantial variation for the ovarian, ovarian cancer testing by race ranging from 22% in black women to 34% in white women. And so that was a bit distressing. Um, our colleagues actually did an update and uh, for data through 2019. 
And again, on the right, you see the logistic regression <clears throat> for genetic testing trends over time by racial and ethnic subgroups. And so really the take home here is that genetic testing rates have actually increased, which is really good. However, the racial and ethnic disparities have not improved. And in fact, as you can see from the lower right graphic, the disparities are actually largest for cancer types with the best established guidelines for genetic testing, that is ovarian and breast. Um, I did mention that we're working on automation via our DOE partnership. And this is actually very exciting. Um, so we have now an ePath auto extraction API, which is important because we're working towards having real-time reporting of our incident data, incidence data in SEER. We're now about two years and a little more behind. And so we're trying to gradually ratchet that back so that we're um, one year behind and then maybe even just a few months behind. Um, and so this API auto extracts structured data from more than 4 million unstructured pathology reports that we receive annually in the SEER program in real time. Um, what we found is that manual screening, which was done uh, previously and is still done to a certain extent, requires about 55 seconds per report. So that's about 46,000 person hours just for this task alone. So that's a lot of effort. And so focusing on the five elements that we're auto extracting, site, subsite, histology, behavior, and laterality, um, the API is about 18,000 times faster than a human. And it's now in production in 16 registries. We're able to auto extract between 23 and 27%, and we're actually a little bit over 30% right now of all path reports that um, can be auto coded with greater than 98% accuracy across all of those four data items. And this is um, even this small amount is still about 14,000 person hours of labor that are saved every year. And so we're working with the DOE to iteratively improve the proportion that are auto coded through new models, um, large language models and integrated registry processes. And I wanna mention here that this is one of the things that came out of this, which is very exciting, is that the registries are actually leveraging this real-time uh, data capture on path reports for rapid case identification for patients, for research studies, for clinical trials, et cetera. Um, the other area that I wanted to mention, and this is something that again, is a, a very new area for the SEER program, and in fact, for all registries, and that is capturing recurrence in the SEER data. And we're leveraging linkages as well as automation from the DOE. This is really important because identification of recurrent metastatic disease, as you well know, is a critical outcome for both patients and their providers. And right now, there are no population level data on the risk of recurrent metastatic disease for patients to look at at the time of diagnosis. The challenge associated with capturing this information for surveillance is that METs can be diagnosed across inpatient and outpatient settings, uh, as well as by multiple specialties. So there's no single source of, source of truth that we can go to. And so what we're doing is we're approaching the capture of recurrent metastatic disease um, using consolidation of multiple different data sources. We're leveraging the DOE ePath API for recurrence. Um, we're using an algorithm that uses some of the ICD, ICD diagnosis codes from both inpatient and outpatient claims. Um, these are secondary diagnosis, secondary cancer diagnosis codes. And we're leveraging uh, one of the registry reported hospital reported um, uh, measures of recurrence. And the, the interesting thing about this is that it has a low sensitivity, but is really very valid when, it, when it's um, identified. The problem is, is that most patients with recurrence or metastatic disease don't actually get back to the hospital to get this reported. And so right now what we're doing is creating a subset of cases with and without recurrent metastatic disease based on the consolidation of those data sources. And we hope to have this available by um, the end of the year of, the, of 2024. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about related to automation is something that I'm super excited about, and that is automating data capture from EHRs using um, an application that was developed at CHOP called Extract EHR. Um, so this was this is an API-based um, data pipeline that extracts data from the backend EHR data warehouse. And it was originally developed largely for uh, capture of adverse events and for um, ALL and AML, and then was implemented in four other facilities listed here. And it represents both Epic and Cerner um, systems, which is pretty exciting. And so what we've done in the last year and a half or so is under the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, we're expanding the data that we collect um, beyond AEs to pathology reports, radiology reports, clinical notes, 
lab data, et cetera, to all pediatric cancer sites beyond ALL and AML. Um, and the data will actually be sent to registries um, in near real time. However, I think an important component of this is that the data will also be made available to the pediatric facility from which the, the data, the EHR uh, data are being extracted. And so this is an opportunity to use this for research support, both for the registries as well as for the facilities. Right now, um, we have an initial download of these data in CHOP as well as Children's Hospital of Atlanta. And we're in the process of um, implementing this in Texas Children's and Seattle Children's. And we have two additional um, hospitals, pediatric facilities that we're implementing hopefully by July of, of this year. So we'll have a lot of data to begin to work with. And I think what's really interesting here is that if this is successful for pediatric cancers, there's no reason that this can't be transferable to adult cancers as well. And so um, we're very enthusiastic about uh, potentially using this. So as I said, we um, Sears' main goal is, is really to support research. And so what I wanted to do is take a few moments to talk about some of the, um, I think are exciting, innovative ideas that we are working on with the SEER program. So the first of these is, is residential history that helps us support longitudinal linkages. Um, SEER has now captured each patient's residential history from diagnosis year 2005 forward with LexisNexis. Um, the residential history data are available from about the mid 1990s, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And what's important here is that registries traditionally have captured only the address at the time of diagnosis. And so residential history is really important to us as an essential building block to help us um, do prospective linkages because as you know, cancer patients or, or any patient moves and their, address, their addresses change. And so having that longitudinal address information is really essential to help us link accurately. And this is particularly true for linkages such as with um, the pharmacy data, which don't have things like SSN. And so patients may get their oral antineoplastic four or five years out from their diagnosis. And so having this residential history is really essential. But what I think is very interesting about this is that um, this residential history allows us to support new areas of research. We're now um, linking the retrospective and prospective address information with several environmental exposure databases as a demonstration project. And these include PM 2.5, the RSEI microdata on, uh, from the EPA industrial exposure database, and then radon testing. And so right now we're currently developing a database with linked residential history, um, excuse me, and these pilot environmental databases, which we hope to make available to the larger research community, just as we did for the genetic test data. Another area that we've been exploring is capturing financial toxicity and social determinants of health. We just completed a pilot um, to link residential history with cancer and measures of financial toxicity. The study was really interesting because what was shocking here is that one third of our cohort had financial vulnerability defined by some major financial adverse events such as a bankruptcy, lien, or eviction before their cancer diagnosis. And if you look at the graphic on the right, you can see that um, there was quite a bit of variation in terms of uh, patients by race and ethnicity who had a major financial adverse event. However, the orange bar are non the orange bars represent non-Hispanic Black patients, and there was significantly higher occurrence of major financial adverse events for Black patients across all of the three sites, both Louisiana, Seattle, and Georgia. And so we are now creating a database with these data, again, that will be accessible to outside researchers. And we're hoping to scale it to other registries in 2024. Um, and this is, this is another area that I think is, is very important for the SEER program. Um, and that is extending our ROI for SEER using the SEER data versus um, with outlink, what I call outlinkages. Um, so traditionally, we've brought data into the SEER program, but I think it's very important to allow our data to go out so that we can support a broader research footprint um, than we have been traditionally. And so, of course, one of those is the N3C data, um, which we've linked with, and we're very excited about that. Um, we've also been working to create a COVID real-world data infrastructure um, using Health Verity Claims, Quest, and LabCorp uh, laboratory testing information, Northwell, and of course, the, the SEER program. Um, we're working now on, Ken can probably talk more about this, on an NCATS cancer tenant, which is sort of equivalent to N3C, and that's in process. 
We've also done out linkages with the Veterans Administration um, and, and, it, and we're doing a two-way data exchange. This is really important because in the past, um, the VA has not been really forthcoming about sharing uh, cancer information on patients from the VA. And in fact, um, the VA does not necessarily have a good history of uh, veterans with cancer. So, so this is really an important opportunity to help the VA better understand what's going on um, with their veterans in terms of their risk of cancer. Uh, we're in discussions with the All of Us cohort, which we're very excited about because um, the All of Us is having uh, genomic testing data for their patients. And they're also doing residential history on non-cancer controls. And we think that this is gonna be a huge advantage for us um, given the, the environmental exposure uh, work that we're doing and I talked about a moment ago. We're also um, getting ready to link with my, myriad genetic laboratory data. Um, and I talked about that in linkage where they gave us their data, but this is actually an out linkage. Um, Myriad has a new cloud-based system that they are opening to academic researchers across the US. Uh, it's a secure system. And um, I think it's very important because right now what they have are the genetic and genomic tests that they do, but they don't have any clinical context. And so SEER is actually able to provide some of that context for those genetic and genomic test results, such as um, cancer diagnosis, um, specifics about the diagnosis, stage of diagnosis, and then of course, survival information. So the last thing that I wanted to spend a bit of time on are some of the recent innovations that we're working on with the SEER program. Uh, the virtual SEER-linked biorepository or BTR, the virtual pooled registry, and the National Childhood Cancer Registry. So <clears throat> the, the VTR or virtual, virtual SEER-linked biorepository um, completed a pilot uh, and with two case control studies. So we looked at long-term cancer survivors of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And as you probably know, most uh, pancreatic cancer patients do not survive more than a year or two. And so we actually looked at long-term survivors versus those who died um, within the more traditional short period of time. We also looked um, at local stage breast cancer patients who had early mortality, because one would expect that someone with local stage breast cancer who got treated would actually survive a long period of time. And so those are our two case control studies. And we believe that there are some unique aspects of this infrastructure which make, which make it very complementary to existing biorepositories. First, it's a population-based sampling frame from both community and academic path labs. And because this is across entire populations from multiple registries, it includes the ability to select specimens based on rare tumors, rare outcomes, or even targeted subpopulations by race, age, or residential history, et cetera. It's already linked to rich clinical data and outcomes with the ability to capture custom data if, in, if needed. And of course, it's a renewable resources with more than 850,000 cancer cases submitting annually to the program. And it's complementary to an existing biorepository, CHTN, which is sponsored by the NCI. And in fact, the CHTN considers this as actually almost a partner um, biorepository. We're in the process now of trying to scale this. We've funded two registries uh, in FY23, and we're hoping to incrementally scale this over time to many more registries. Um, this is just information um, actually on the, the pilot study, so I'm not going to spend much time here, but I did want to give you an example of some of the potential value of the VTR. Again, specifically with the ability to address, uh, to, to capture rare tumors, rare outcomes, and to provide existing clinical annotations. So this is a study that um, JC Zanclusen was doing of rare tumors. And um, so the tumors that he was looking at were, were refractory cancers for peripheral T-cell lymphomas, cancers of unknown primary, and refractory DLBs. BCL. Um, and what's interesting is that for the first uh, study, they had accrued tissue from only 48 subjects in five years from 20 different sites, including MSK. Um, for the second one, um, they had accrued tissue for only 150 sub subjects in five years via 14 international sites. And so I think what's really telling here is that we leverage the SEER um, VTR and residual uh, registries to identify potential cases to meet accruals. And as you can see here, there were um, 180 and 177 peripheral T cells from Hawaii and Iowa, and um, 165 and 190 from refractory DLBCL. So, so those alone, and they're in the process now of gathering those data and, and bringing in the tissue so that he can do the analysis and complete his study. Um, 
the uh, next one that I would like to talk about, which I think is very exciting, is the virtual pooled registry or VPR. So the goal of this is to really create a capacity that's similar to the National Din in Death Index, excuse me, um, without physical aggregation of patient information. Um, this is broader than the SEER program, and it includes 43 population-based cancer registries shown here on the map on the right that provide a standardized, comprehensive, and curated source of cancer data. And registry linkages can ascertain cancer incidents, long-term follow-up for cohorts, clinical trials, and other study types. Because we have one central research application and research file submission, there's a standardized and simultaneous linkage process that occurs with all of the registries. And we're using, um, we're now developing a match pro privacy preserving record linkage module that should be available actually this summer. Um, it's, it's almost ready right now. And then we're working uh, towards an F FNIH support for sustainability and further scaling of this um, application. And this is just an example, and obviously I, I know you can't read it, uh, but, but what I think is important here is that to date, more than 13 million cohort participants have been processed across the 43 state registries that are participating, and there have been more than a million matched individuals with cancer. So I think that's pretty dynamic, and we're really not at scale at this point, and that's where we're trying to go. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is the National Childhood Cancer Registry, or NCCR, which is near and dear to my heart as well. Um, this, again, is broader than the SEER program, and it's, it's population-based data for all individuals that are diagnosed with cancer under age 40 since 1995. We included under 40 because there's a large AYA and young adult population that often gets ignored um, in terms of their cancer risk. And so it includes about 1.7 million patients or 70% of the U.S. population and 25 registries. And so what we're doing here is building on cancer registries, but we're including many additional linked data, just as we're doing with SEER, um, from the children's oncology group related to clinical trials, the virtual pool registry to identify multiple primary cancers, as well as to consolidate data. Um, uh, we're linking in with some birth defects registries, the pediatric proton therapy registry, and also some medical and pharmacy claims from, uh, from multiple data sources. One of the things that's exciting about this is that we were able to support um, a cancer center supplement that provided longitudinal harmonized data from 14 NCI supported cancer centers. And so um, this is actually very exciting. And where we're going here, all of those data will be available uh, in the right on, on the NCCR data platform. And we're actually in the process now of getting ready to do a soft launch in June of 2024. And we already have almost 1,500 users who have signed the DUA to gain access um, to the NCCR data platform. Um, on, on the left, we have uh, NCCR Explorer, which is actually sort of canned um, uh, queries that you can do. And it's pretty simple. And in fact, it's so simple that even I could use it, which is a pretty low bar. Uh, and then the middle, we have the uh, NCCR data in SEERSTAT, which is a more sophisticated application. And <clears throat> You can do um, things like frequency, incident, survival, et cetera, and many other uh, types of analysis because it's a much more open platform. Um, but the, the NCCR data platform, I think, is probably the most exciting because it will allow for cohort discovery and it will allow for um, specific request of the data once you've created your cohort. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and would be happy to take any questions. Okay, I think that, that was a great talk. So much information really provide depth of what you're doing at NCI with SEER. Um, I'm probably I, I'm probably gonna have to watch it watch it again because there was so much material in there. Sorry, I know there's a lot, but I, I want to give people just a flavor of what we're doing so that you can say, oh, hey, let me go look at this. Um, yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's like with the EHR data, we always have these partial pictures of patients and. The SEER data provides, you're working towards a very like detailed information of a patient through their lifetime. So, yep, exactly. And, you know, we're not there yet. We do have population based data on many aspects of their cancer, right? And I think that's really important to note. So, one of the things that I think is valuable here, which um, we don't have from EHRs, we don't have from some of the data aggregators, is that we have that denominator so that 
even if you don't have population level data, for example, in pharmacies, what you can do is you can compare the patients for whom you do have the data with those that you don't. So you understand the representativeness of the um, patients for whom you have the data. So there's a sort of a step up for that, but we're really working towards having population level data for sure. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Carlos, would you, uh, sorry. Janos, would you like to read those? Um, there's one from Nabil from earlier. Actually, both of them are from Nabil. It's in the Q&A. So, um, yeah, I see the, okay, the SEER Medicaid data. Now, interestingly, um, the, SEER, the SEER CMS linkage is actually a separate uh, program within my division. Um, and this year they do have the SEER Medicaid data. And um, I don't know that it's available for public release just yet, but I think you have to go through the ResDAC process to be able to get that. And uh, so- But you know, healthcare link data. Yeah, so so the UHC um, link data, we are not keeping all of the raw claims data because they did not want us to be releasing the raw claims data. So what we're doing from that is we're actually extracting the relevant information. We have all the ICD codes, we have the dates, we have the procedure codes, uh, CPT and HCPCS um, and the ICD procedure codes. And we also have, um, I, said, I said the dates. And so we have that longitudinal information. And so all that's being pulled in the context of enrollment as well, so that you know whether someone's continuously enrolled. It, it gets really complicated with um, non-Medicare uh, patients because people can go in and out of enrollment. And so having that context to understand you know, who should be in your denominator is really important. Um, we're in the process now of creating that um, infrastructure. And in fact, uh, a lot of the claims data and the enrollment file will be available in the NCCR data platform. Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit longer for the um, for the actual see or adult data. Does that answer your question? I hope. Lynn, um, th this is Ken. Um, I, I for you all on the on the Zoom. Lynn was the person that made having seer linked with an N3C possible, and so we an enormous thank you. Um, and and also just the. Truth and advertising lens also the person who's given us the ability to link it in, in the new cancer um, enclave and, and with um, the team. So we're really, really excited. Um, and thank you, Lynn, so much. Um, I think that maybe this is for, for Nabil, Nabil, I this may help you with your your answer. Um, we we've been working really hard with um our CMS uh brethren um and Hopefully, uh, we have the final, final approval to link all of the patients in N3C that are uh, with with Medicaid and Medicare, not just ones that have a diagnosis of COVID positive. So that should be coming within the next 60 days. And those people, if they are from one of the SEER sites and 17 of the sites in N3C have, um, have allowed us to link their data, those all CMS will link to SEER, which will be more the EHR, which will be linked to mortality. So all, all will be linked. And so I'm not sure that answer helps. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And Ken, I didn't realize that you were that close because um, not to get into squabbles between federal entities, but CMS has been really strict about uh, allowing release of their data and they want NIH to have one enclave and just one enclave. So we're still trying to work that through. But I'm I'm super excited about that. And we had talked in the past about potentially having, you know, the SEER data linked to Medicaid in particular. I have a question for you, Lynn. So first of all, thank you so much for just giving that incredible overview. I, I think you've inspired a lot of people here. I mean, Janos is not the only one to go back and listen to again to all the great features and data sources that you all have integrated. I had not realized there were quite so many. It's really quite an accomplishment. Um, a lot of folks on this call tend to be the sort of hands-on keyboard innovators around um, the integrated data. I'm just wondering if you could speak to some of the, the, the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see for this group to really innovate as we work towards that 
um, NCI enclave um, with the SEER data, because this is the, the small army of people who I think can really move the field forward. So what do you think um, the biggest opportunities are once we have these data linkages and, and enclave in place? Oh, thanks, Melissa. That's a, that's a tough question. So, so I really think um, what's very, very important to remember is that there's no single source of data that can provide us this comprehensive longitudinal picture of patients, whether it's cancer or some other disease. And so I think that having the mentality that the EHR is going to give us everything is just is not true. And, and I think that's one of the things that we have sort of struggled with. And while a lot of our basic data comes from, for example, hospitals, um, many of the data that items that we have are not available to the hospital reporting entity. So I mentioned um, recurrence. They, they often don't have recurrence. But I think a perfect example of that is um, Oncotype DX21 gene assay. We had been collecting that in the registries through the hospitals for a couple of years. And we ended up linking directly with what was then Genomic Health Incorporated to get you know, their, their total population of patients. And what we found was that 41% of the Oncotype test results were not captured by the hospital. And the reason for that is because the oncology physicians you know, out in the community would order the test, right? And then they would, um, they would, the path lab would send the path specimen to GHI and then GHI would send the test results back to the oncology pr practitioner, but it would never get back to the hospital. So I think it's very, very important to recognize that depending on what you're looking to do, you have to think about many different sources to bring together. And that's certainly one of the things that's been a very difficult lesson for us. And in some ways frustrating, you know, it's just like the pharmacy data. We don't have population level. We're working on it. But, but our healthcare system is so chaotic, as you know, that it's just um, really impossible to be able to get everything on everybody. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I guess it just expressed some of my frustration and, 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 and really tried to explain why we seem to have this like very sort of diverse um, set of incoming data so that we can provide a more comprehensive picture for each cancer patient. No, that's, that's, fan, that's fantastically inspirational. I think we're... We regularly, as part of the good algorithmic practice and just best practices, you know, try to remind folks that the EHR data is, we have a lot of it, but it's really messy, it's really incomplete, it does not provide a complete picture. And, you know, I think that's where these partnerships really are a great opportunity to triangulate and, and bring these different data sources together so we can have a more complete picture, which I call putting the patient back together again, because all the data about the individuals is out there. It's just not yeah. all in one yeah. place, right? And so um, you guys have just done an amazing job of bringing many sources together. And we're just so excited to, to work to, together. And, and I think also, you know, one of the great opportunities with the N3C um, cancer enclave in general is just because there's so much data on the EHR side, we can really corroborate the findings that we have from much smaller data sources that might be more precise and vice versa. And so that's where um, I think there's some really great um, kind of more methodological research about data quality that that, you know, can really kind of be built in algorithmically in context uh, down the road where, where we have smaller data sets. Actually, I, I, I love that. Um, and, and I love N3C because I really, I believe that there's no single source of truth, right? Depending on the question that you're asking, you may want to go here or there. And so N3C provides an opportunity to complement much of the, the data that we have in the SEER program. So I think there are uh, important questions that can be addressed using the N3C cancer tenant, which cannot be addressed you know, with the SEER program. Uh, and I think the perfect example of that is like the all of us, right? It's a, you know, it's a cohort study, it's volunteer, but there are really great opportunities that we can use to understand what's going on with patients by leveraging the, the strength of all of us and the strength of the SEER program. So I think this kind of, you know, cross institute and uh, cross commercial um, collaboration is, is really essential if we're going to move forward because cancer care is so complicated, as you know. I think we have one more question in chat from the deal. Um, if I understand cor you correctly to date, Sierra does not have recurrence data yet. I assume yes. it's true with the linked data set. Um, yes, that's actually true. Um, and, you know, as I said, 
it's really hard to get this information because you could get your recurrence diagnosed by your primary care physician. It could be done by biochemical recurrence. It could be radiation oncologist, your surgeon, your oncologist. So all these different sources would have to come together to be able to, to fully capture patients who have recurrent metastatic disease or even recurrence. And so we're trying, just like with the pharmacy data, we're really trying to build um, to the population level, but it's incredibly complex. And so what we're trying to do is to start small and have um, a cohort of patients of, of um, patients that were very comfortable have recurrent metastatic disease and those that were comfortable do not have recurrent metastatic disease. And we wanna make those data available. But ultimately our goal is of course to have recurrence information for the entire population. But, but really there's just no information out there right now. Um, and, and really even for large data sets of patients, it's very hard to capture that information. I'm sure it's also very difficult to capture that on like five to 10 year time scale, right? Or 10 to 15 or 20, it's yep. even harder. So, yep, yep. And, and actually, um, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting, and I've been trying to <laughs> sort of convince some of the folks is, you know, I said we, we linked with the children's oncology group because there was this, there was this impression, and people have been sort of using the term, oh, 95% of kids are in, you know, children with cancer are in clinical trials, COG trials. And I was like, ah, I'm not sure that that's so, so we actually did this linkage. We worked closely with COG and um, it's been a great collaboration. And it turns out that about 37% of patients, uh, pediatric patients under the age of 20 are in clinical trials um, or have been in a COG trial. And that includes, you know, biorepositories, registries, whatever. So it's not anywhere near what we thought but I will say that the other analysis that we did was that um, about 65 to 75% of kids under the age of 20 are actually seen at a COG facility. So, so you know, if you believe in, in you know, academic centers and, and cancer center um, uh, provision of care, a lot of these patients are treated what we call per protocol. So they're getting really good care. So there's kind of two different levels of doing this. And, you know, the, the our COG colleagues I was a little worried when we were going to tell, when we told them that we came up with 37% and they said, oh yeah, yeah, that's what we thought. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, so I really think there are opportunities yeah. to, to work with these data. In fact, um, I've been speaking with uh, ECOG Akron to do a similar project as we're doing for um, the COG, but back to your question, sorry, I, I got carried away. Um, the most of the clinical trials, as you know, only follow patients for two years, maybe five years, even the pediatric trials don't follow patients for very long. And the problem is, is that we don't know what their risk is of, you know, long-term severe adverse sequelae of subsequent primary cancers, particularly in kids, as well as um, longer term death. And that's one of the things that we've been working with the COG on because the, um, after about 10 years, um, those kids tend to sort of fall off and they start doing worse again. And so I think it's very important to really think about that longer term follow up for these patients. I think I think we I think we have any more questions in the chat. But that was a great presentation. A lot of information. Thank you so much. Sorry, I know it was a lot, but but no, but it's it's you, it's um, it's share my slides. So it's a lot of very useful information, right? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and you know, working with this data is so important. It is, and it's fun. So, um, happy to share my slides. Um, you can if you want to share those. That's that's um, that's my pleasure. So, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you, Doctor Bye bye. Bye.